something happened uh, that you weren't left with a huge bunch of out-of-pocket costs. It is true that you can always get cheaper insurance if it has really high deductibles or really high co-payments or doesn't cover as many things. Uh, and so there has to be a balance that's struck there. I just want to point out, though, that the principle of pooling is at the center of both the Senate and the House bill. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because there was a lot of talk about government takeover of health care. And the implication, I think, was that everybody was going to have to sign up for a government uh, health care plan. Now, that's not the issue. What, what the issue here, which we've had an honest disagreement about, is how much should government set a baseline versus just letting people decide that, uh, you know, I can't really uh, get decent insurance, but, you know, uh, maybe this is better than nothing. And that's a legitimate argument. I, I, I don't disagree with that, but I just want to point out that when we start talking about how much government involvement we're ta uh, is at issue here, it's not because the House or the Senate bills are a government takeover of health care. It is that the House and the Senate bills put in place some regulations that restrict how insurance companies operate, and if there's an exchange or a pool that's set up, that there is a baseline sort of minimum requirements uh, that were expected, and I understand that there may be some philosophical differences on the other side of the aisle about that issue. Uh, I'm, uh, Chuck, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank you. I think this has been a constructive dialogue. I was uh, glad to hear my friend Tom Coburn's remarks. I think we agree with most of them, and particularly the point that about a third of all of the spending that's done in Medicare, Medicaid, I would imagine a lot of it's in the private sector as well, doesn't go to really good health care, goes to other things. And the real nub of this is how do we wring that waste out, that fraud, abuse, duplication, without interfering with the good care that we want every person on Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance to get. The average citizen knows this happens. How many times when you look at your medical bill, you've undergone a minor procedure, and you see Dr. Smith, $4,000, and you sort of vaguely remember he just waved and poked his head in the door? Or how about, probably it's happening right now, there's some salesman talking to some doctor and saying, hey, my company will finance a machine for you for a million dollars. So you don't have to pay for it. You can gradually pay it. We'll show you how to fill it up all the time and you'll increase your income by $200,000. And there's another machine three blocks away that's already working and available. So these are the things we have to go after. And Tom, I thought your suggestion of undercover patients, and I tried to check here, I don't think we do it now, is a great idea. And it's one that we can come together on. I think there are other things that we can come together on. Senator Cantwell put a provision in the Senate bill that said we ought to reward doctors for doing quality, not quantity. So that doctor, and there's a small number of doctors, that Gawande study showed, thing in the New Yorker that I think we've all read, that a small number of people who are just trying to maximize their income throw the whole system off, it threw the whole city of McAllen, Texas off while El Paso had much lower rates. Maria Cantwell has a provision in there which I would think you folks could agree on that says that we ought to reward doctors for the quality, not the quantity, not the number of times they could put someone through a machine, but how good the care is. There's a provision in there, um, Senator Rockefeller author, that comes in the insurance part that says 80 to 85 percent of what insurance companies put forward should go to the pa pay, get money in for, should go to the patient. So I think we can do all of these things, but it does, but if we're going to eliminate the waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare, it does mean we're going to cut some of that out. And when I hear my friend Dave Camp say, you cannot cut money out of Medicare, well, we don't want to cut the good stuff that you point out, or not, or prevent, add the prevention, but if we're going to, if one third, if what Senator Coburn says, that one third of Medicare doesn't go to patient care, you can't just get up there and say, we don't want to cut anything out of Medicare. We want to cut the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. And I think that's where we can find common ground on some of the things you've mentioned, some of the things that are in our bill. And I hope at least in this area we can move forward that way because 
frankly, the Republican Party has always stood for getting rid of the waste, fraud, and abuse in the system. In 97, it was the centerpiece of your program. And all of a sudden, this year, we're hearing, don't, don't do any of that. That's something that I think we can come together on. I thank you. Uh, Brother, can we turn to John? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I'm yeah. sorry. You, you had John. We're going to go uh, to John. And then we're going to go to Jim Clyborne, and then I think we're going to uh, uh, take a break because we've uh, run out of time. So, John. Th thank you, Mr. President. I think you framed the issue very well just a moment ago because there are some fundamental differences between us here that we cannot paper over. And, Mr. President, when you said that this is a philosophical debate and it's a legitimate debate, I agree with that. Um, we do not agree about the fundamental question of who should be mostly in charge. And you identified this question as central. Do you trust the states or do you trust Washington? Do you trust patients and doctors making the decision or do you trust Washington? Now, there's a mix of both, of course, in health care. But there is a big difference between our approaches. And there is so much in the bills that you've supported that puts control in Washington that we have a very difficult time supporting those provisions. And it's not a matter of just saying we all agree on the goal of reducing uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. We all do, of course. It's how you do it. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, Dave Camp, I think, pointed out the, the answer to the dispute that you and Lamar Alexander had a moment ago, and he was exactly right. Let me quote from the Congressional Budget Office letter. This is from Doug Elmendorf to Evan Bayh, November 30th, 2009. Quote, CBO and Joint Tax Committee estimate that the average premium per person covered, including dependents, for new non-group policies would be about 10% to 13% higher in 2016 than the average premium for non-group coverage in the same year under current law. Oliver Wyman, a very respected third-party group, says it's even more, about 54% in my state of Arizona, 72% increase. Why is it so? For a variety of reasons, but one of which both you and Dave Camp agreed on. It is a richer benefit. How did it get that way? Because the federal government would mandate it under your legislation in the insurance exchanges. And as a result, there would be a higher cost. How does this happen? There is an actuarial requirement of 60% actuarial value in the exchange for the least costly plan. But the average in the country today of a high deductible plan is 48%. The range today is 40 to 80%. And the average is between 55 and, and 60. So what the government is doing here is saying, we're going to mandate that the insurance cover more things than it does right now, and therefore the cost is going to go up. Second example, you say, how can we help small businesses? Well, we know one way you don't help small businesses is by raising the payroll, uh, the Medicare payroll tax on them, which is what this legislation does. Besides that, it's a job killer. Look at the taxes on beneficiaries as well. This is a third example. You, you don't cut costs when you raise taxes on medical devices that help us, when you raise taxes on pharmaceutical products, uh, when you raise taxes on the insurance them, uh, premiums themselves. Quote, these fees on insurers, medical devices, and pharmaceuticals would increase costs for the affected firms which would be passed on to purchasers and would ultimately raise insurance premiums by a corresponding amount. Congressional Budget Office. So when you raise these taxes, in all of the different fees that are in this legislation, it inevitably increases the costs on the consumer. And why do you have to, to raise all of this money? Because of the expenses of the legislation that, that underlie all of this. That's why Republicans would rather start not by having to raise a lot of money in order to pay the high cost of this bill, but to start a piece at a time directing solutions to specific problems. That way you don't incur all of the costs up front, which require you to raise the tax. Last quick point. One of the worst things about this is for people that have catastrophic medical expenses today, after you've spent 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, you can, you can deduct that. This bill would raise that to 10%. Who does that hurt? The very people you promised, Mr. President, that you wouldn't allow taxes to be raised on. Average age, 45. Average income, $69,000. These are not wealthy people. Just another example of why, because the bill has to raise so much money, it ends up hurting the very people that we want to help. Okay. Uh, John, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to you, Jim, but I, you know, since as has tended